Wong, I'm an idiot. Wanda is the one after America's power, and I've led her right to us. Strange, you fool! We must gather the sorcerers. Kamrataj must become a fortress. Right. We must protect America. Okay, I'm just gonna stop you right there. Y you see what you did, right, Steven? Y you portal around, that's, that's kind of the big thing with you sorcerers. Portals from point A to point B and all that, so... Why are you so worried about leading Scarlet Witch here when you could just, you know, boop right on through? <laughs> You're a fool, Strange. Your hubris blinds you. Oh, don't even get me started on you, Miss I Can't Traverse the Multiverse, but apparently I can send flaming rune demons to do my bidding across the multiverse. And also, I never thought that, hmm, in an infinite number of universes, there might be one where I died, but my kids are still alive so I can take my own place without having to kill anyone. Have none of you people ever watched an episode of Rick and Morty? No. Nope. -uh. Not really my thing. To be fair, you have to have a very high IQ to understand. And Rick and Morty. The humor is extremely subtle. You know what? Without a Screw solid it. I mean, pizza balls. Hello, Internet! Welcome to Film Theory, where today we're talking about Sam Raimi's demo reel. I, I mean, uh, Doctor Strange 2 Multiverse of Madness. On that note, by the way, if you walked out of theaters and your cinema snob friend was raving about how Sam Raimi the whole thing was, here's your 30 second primer of what that meant. Anytime the camera zoomed in and twisted towards a door or something, straight out of Evil Dead. Same with all the gruesome body horror, practical effect zombies and jump scares. Flying eyeball, Evil Dead 2. Frenetic close-ups with rapid cuts, Evil Dead and Dark Man. Scary hands pop out of the walls and ceiling, drag me to hell. Giant octopus fights along the sides of New York buildings, literally just Spider-Man 2. Even that infuriating shot of the pizza guy punching himself and then breaking the fourth wall at the end, that is Bruce Campbell, one of his go-to actors in pretty much every film that he does, directly referencing a fight sequence that he had against his own hand in Evil Dead 2. I mean, there's referencing your own work, and then there's turning in the same assignment twice. Anyway, while I wound up being wrong in my prediction that Evil Strange here was missing a hand as a reference to, again, Evil Dead, I at least was right that at some point there'd be hand shenanigans as a direct reference back to Sam Raimi's past work, so half points? And hey, even though I was wrong about that, boy howdy were we right about practically everything else in this thing. Sure, we didn't predict the movie pulling a trigger on Chekhov's Dead Strange for the grand finale, but everything else? Not too shabby. We called the appearance of the Illuminati before Patrick Stewart's voice was in the trailer. We knew that this would be a Doctor Strange redemption story directly calling back to Spider-Man No Way Home. In the grand calculus of the multiverse. Their sacrifice means infinitely more than their lives. Heck, one of our writers knew that Wanda was gonna be the villain back in 2019 before Endgame released and before he started working with us. What if what they're not saying yet is that Wanda isn't just the co-star in Doctor Strange 2, she's the villain. Multiverse of Madness is kind of an awkward title, but it's also an acronym. True story, that theory of his is actually the reason that he's on the team now. Glad to have you with us, Bob. But okay, I didn't just make a whole episode to take a few victory laps. When it comes to theory crafting, it's not about being right or wrong, it's about what comes next. Enough focusing on the past, it's time to look forward. To break down all the big reveals and see what we predict it means for the next several steps in the MCU timeline. Let's start small. A detail that I'm sure everyone noticed was Doctor Strange's magic cloak ripping and then getting repaired with a distinctly non-matching blue patch. Feels like a super random thing to include and then not really talk about, right? Well, notice who did the repair. A variant of Doctor Strange's would-be girlfriend, Christine Palmer, in the Illuminati's universe of 838. Notably, she makes it a point to say that she works not just with the Illuminati, but for the Baxter Foundation. Baxter, as in the Baxter Building, which is most famously the Fantastic Four's headquarters. Now, this might wind up to be nothing, but in the comics, Reed Richards, aka Mr. Fantastic, is a renowned inventor, and one of his big breakthrough technologies is known as Unstable Molecules, a special super super adaptive synthetic blue fabric that can adapt to almost any environment, including extreme heat, cold, and pressure. Basically, in the comics, they use this to explain how the Fantastic Four's costumes are able to cope with the powers of the four heroes. Super stretchy guy, turned to fire guy, turn invisible woman, and rock guy. So, if I were a betting man, I'd expect that Stephen Strange, by taking his cloak with a patch of unstable molecule fabric back to the MCU, will prompt researchers of Universe 616 to analyze the fabric and discover the material for themselves. Thus, they'll have 
introduced a brand new particle to the world, causing Science in the Universe 616 to take a massive leap forward. I'd expect this to happen in the next movie where talk of particles and science tend to take center stage, aka Ant-Man Quantumania. The alternative is that this is what prompts the creation of Universe 616's own Fantastic Four whenever that movie is able to find and keep a director. Of course, it could also be a patch from Doctor Strange 838's cloak, which we see Reed holding in the flashback and appears to be blue as well. Either way, kind of weird for her not to bring it up since our Strange's cloak is kind of a living thing, and she was specifically concerned about cross-universal contamination just minutes prior. Bottom line, they wanted you to remember that that piece of the cape is from somewhere else. But blue fabric wasn't the only exciting thing to come out of the Baxter building. Obviously, the whole reason we were visiting that universe was to meet the Illuminati, a group made up of the biggest, most powerful superhero team leaders. From a narrative standpoint, watching them get absolutely curb stomped emphasized how dangerous the Scarlet Witch is. Or maybe more accurately, how deadly falling rocks are, cause seriously, falling rocks killed Captain Marvel? A superhero infused with the power of an Infinity Stone? Gotta press X to doubt that one, Sam. And then later, it's how Wanda, this all-powerful multiversal being, ends her own life too? Forget Thanos and Kang, apparently the next big threat to the MCU is a little thing called granite. From a business standpoint though, this little side trip into Cameo Town just gave Disney plenty of trailer fodder while also delivering them a billion dollar test audience. That way they can see how people might react to Jim from The Office starring as Reed Richards, or a live action Captain Carter post What If. Of the cast of characters in the lineup though, one that I don't think anyone saw coming was an Inhumans reference. The only Marvel TV project with fewer actual fans than Iron Fist. And this wasn't just a reference either. This was a full on return. Black Bolt, you know the guy with the tuning fork on his head that gets a matrix pulled on him? He's being played by Anson Mount, the original actor from the TV show. <laughs> And this reference actually spells some massively important things for the future of one character who's getting a show real soon, Ms. Marvel. In case you forgot, and if you did, I don't blame you, because Inhumans worked really hard to be the most forgettable thing to ever feature a giant teleporting dog and choreographed hair fights. Inhumans wasn't just Marvel Studios' first and arguably only undeniable failure, but at one point it was set up to be a game changer for the entire brand. Originally introduced in the pages of Fantastic Four in the 60s, the Inhumans are one of Marvel's oldest and weirdest big idea franchises. To put it simply, they're a race of superhuman beings with strange powers that sometimes look like monsters and who've hidden underground from humanity for centuries. Sound familiar? It should. They're basically the 1.0 version for the whole superhero as metaphor for class, racism, and social issue ideas that Marvel would later refine into more well-known projects like the Eternals, and most importantly, X-Men. So when it's the early 2010s and someone other than Disney owns the movie license for X-Men, the House of Mouse was all like, hey, can, can we make these guys our version of that? So Marvel Publishing gave the franchise a huge push in the comics. Storyline suddenly had mutants going practically extinct, while the population of humans discovering their hidden inhuman powers exploded. Ah, the cynical business practices that dictate the creative culture that we consume. Corporate synergy for for the win. Meanwhile, over in the cinematic universe, the TV series Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. revealed one of its main characters as an Inhuman herself. This kicked off multiple series-length storylines, filling in some Inhuman's backstory of being the result of experiments by the Kree, that's the blue guys from Captain Marvel, and setting up the X-Men style protecting those who fear them storyline, all in anticipation for the big rollout of an Inhuman's MCU feature movie about Black Bolt and the royal family, which obviously happened and went on to smash box office records and no one remembers the X-Men anymore. No, clearly the strategy didn't work. Then humans just didn't catch on, and their movie project was downgraded to a TV series that very much has the look of a contractually obligated production. Awesome. I can't imagine why people wouldn't have responded to this. It couldn't have had anything to do with the hairy, sexy time that happens within the first three minutes of episode one, or the fact that the main character can't talk without killing anyone. Are you going to speak? Are you going to use your voice? Kill your only brother. Just like you murdered our parents. Or heck, maybe people just couldn't handle the drama. Where did you send them? You really think I'm going to tell you? Lockjaw, take me to Black Bolt and the others. Lockjaw, wake up! 
Lockjaw! Lockjaw! Anyway, Disney decided to go pay to win and just bought Fox and the X-Men. If you can't beat them, pay $71.3 billion to join them. Really, the only truly significant remnant of that whole weird moment is that it introduced the world to Kamala Khan, aka Miss Marvel. Probably the most popular and widely celebrated new young character Marvel's debuted in the comics over the last 20 years. And wouldn't you know it, she's an inhuman. In the comics, Black Bolt uses what's called a Terrigen Crystal to produce a magical mist, activating the genetic mutation that enables latent inhumans to gain their abilities. So it's been a huge open question for fans whether the Miss Marvel TV series, which is coming out on Disney Plus less than a month from now, is gonna use a different origin story. I mean, it would make sense. Why tie your fresh new popular teen hero to a flop TV show based on obscure comics even boomers didn't care about? But now, suddenly here's Black Bolt showing up in Multiverse of Madness, played by the same actor getting shouted out as the Inhuman King. Does that mean that we sort of have to care about these characters again? And that they're gonna be a part of some big reveal in Miss Marvel? I suspect, kinda yeah, but let me explain. According to the trailers, it looks like Ms. Marvel's powers have gotten changed around for this new series. Usually, she's an inhuman who can stretch like Mr. Fantastic. Instead, it looks more like she's harnessing the power of energy-based crystals. If I were to guess, it's probably because stretchy powers never, never, never look good in live action. <laughs> Especially when you're talking about small TV budgets. However, what's also interesting is that these crystal powers get activated by a bracelet that's a family heirloom. So here's the theory that ties it all back together. The fact that the powers are crystal-based feels important. Remember what I told you about her comics origin? Black Bolt uses something called a Terrigen Crystal to create a mist that activates latent inhuman powers. The same thing happens in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Crystal equals inhuman powers. So my prediction is that the crystal band she's wearing is exactly that. A Terrigen Crystal that probably doesn't get mentioned by name until the last episode of the series. The whole time she thinks that her powers are coming from the bracelet, but the bracelet just unlocks what's inside of her all along. Who knows, maybe the bracelet even breaks and creates the mist and then does all that. Anyway, then we learn the bracelet's origin. An origin from space. You know what you are? Nope, an Inhuman. You see, the twist of the Inhumans always ends up being that their powers come from alien experiments on humans. Kree experiments on humans. And who has a close connection to the Kree? Captain Marvel. We also know that Ms. Marvel is gonna jump straight from her Disney Plus series to join Captain Marvel in The Marvel's Movie, which is likely very outer space themed. The bracelet allows the origin of Kamala's powers to stay self-contained for her initial series, then acts as the jumping off point to create a reasonable through line for the more spacey stuff in the next movie while also opening the door to the other Inhumans to pop in for a hey, we're around two guest appearance, should Marvel want to try that one again? Or, you know, maybe it's just an excuse to bring back the Inhuman that everyone actually likes. You're not just a super cute squish face. You're a teleporting super cute squish face. From there, she'll be waiting in the wings until it's time to join America Chavez as key ultra-powerful members of the Young Avengers. Speaking of Ms. Chavez, can I just ask? I, I wasn't the only one who giggled every time someone in the movie dropped a line like, we need to protect America's power, right? Also, her origin is from a different dimension, but her name is America, and she wears a jacket with the American flag on it. Just saying, the utopian parallel she comes from apparently doesn't know subtlety. Which brings us finally to our hero, Doctor Strange himself. This movie doesn't really give him that much of a character arc so much as it's a reminder that he is a character, as opposed to the plot device that he's been for practically every movie since his cameo in Thor Ragnarok. He's the guy having to make the hard decisions, putting the safety of the universe first and himself last. However, based on the mid credit scene, that looks like it's gonna change. In the mid credit scene, he encounters a brand new character wearing a purple fairy tale outfit named Clea. She's a sorceress from the Dark Dimension who's also the niece of Dormammu. Dormammu? I've come to bargain. Yeah, floating neon space head from the first movie. Don't you notice the family resemblance here? Anyway, Clea's been a fixture of the Doctor Strange comics since the 1960s. As an ally, as an enemy, more recently she's become a Sorcerer Supreme in her own right. What's she doing here? Well, I suspect it's for the other role that she plays in the comics, Steven's love interest. The focus of this movie was re-establishing that Steven tends to put work in front of people. He's constantly undervaluing individual human lives. We saw this in No Way Home, and the message is once again repeated here. The only person he still held ties to was Christine, but this movie makes him realize that no matter the universe, there's never really a chance between the two of them. So thematically, by the end of the movie, he recognizes that people have value, and he starts to contend with the loneliness that he's left with now that Christine is officially out of his life. For him then to complete his narrative arc, he needs to find someone that he's willing to open up to, someone that completes him, and based on his personality, the only people able to do that are just as smart and capable as him. That person will be Clea, likely in Doctor Strange 3, whenever that winds 
winds up happening. It's at that point that he'll finally be able to move on and hand off his responsibilities to someone else. More immediately though is Clea as a plot device. There's this word that everyone keeps using throughout this movie, incursion, which comes straight from the Marvel Comics universe and appears to have roughly the same definition in the MCU as it does in this movie. Collisions between universes that cause destruction to one or both. On the comic side, multiverse incursions are typically the staging grounds for the Marvel crossover event Secret Wars, which, well, not announced, just about everyone including us has been predicting is the end game of the current cycle of Marvel movies. I mean, Miss Minutes tease it up within the first episode of Loki. Long ago. There was a vast multiversal war. When is it gonna happen? Well, before any other Marvel movie was even glancing at the idea of a multiverse, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse jumped into the concept with both feet. That Academy Award-winning animated hit movie is getting a sequel featuring even more alternate Spider-Man, which some are expecting will include Tom Holland's MCU Spidey to connect the two franchises. That sequel recently got double-sized and split into two parts. The first retaining its original title Across the Spider-Verse, but the second now called Beyond the Spider-Verse. Why does that matter? Well, in Multiverse of Madness, the only incursions we hear about are caused by variants of Doctor Strange, but in the comics, they had a different instigator, the Beyonders, a race of omnipotent alien beings who aim to collapse the multiverse by causing incursions, connecting it all back to Secret Wars. And if you think going off of one word in a title is a stretch, remember, we predicted Wanda was a grieving, rampaging mother back in 2019, all because Multiverse of Madness spelled mom. But hey, you know what universe I want to be a part of? The one where I can eat all the pizza balls I want without gaining weight. Sadly, that reality is trapped over there with the whole walk on red thing. Luckily, over here in this universe, I have our sponsor for today's episode, Noom, to help me eat the right amount of pizza balls while still working towards my health goals. Noom is a smarter way of getting healthy. It uses proven psychological and cognitive behavioral therapy practices to help enact change in your life. I've talked in the past about how Noom's program has helped me personally lose three pounds. Now, Five, actually since the last time that we talked about it, despite what Thick Pat over here would have you believe, as well as keep better track of my caffeine intake. But the thing is, Noom approaches these sorts of goals from a different perspective. It's about mindfulness first, not about getting the right numbers to appear on a scale. Setting personal health goals can be scary, because there's always some element of shame if you fall off the wagon or if you have a bad day. Getting onto a scale can be intimidating, because you have to confront your decisions. But with Noom, that's never the primary focus. For instance, the thing I'm working on now with the help of Zoom is sleep. I don't get enough. And my sleep habits are terrible. And Noom isn't pushing me into getting a certain number of hours per night. Rather, it's helping me create routines and habits that lead to better, longer, and deeper sleep. Noom's approach is all based on how the mind works and why humans make the decisions that we do. And that approach is what ultimately leads to lasting change. At least, it seems to have worked for me. So if you have something in your life that you'd like to get healthier about, take your free 30-second quiz today at noom.com slash film theory, or click the link down in the description below. One other thing that I like about Noom is that they just recognize this sort of stuff isn't one size fits all. Yes, it works for me and my personal goals, but maybe not for you. So take the free quiz, it's only 30 seconds, see if new might be a fit for what you want to accomplish in your life, and as always remember, it's all just a theory. A film theory! And cut!